Um, all right, so Revelation chapter um, 16 is where uh, we're going to read and study from the Word of God. Revelation is, um, is an epic, and it is, uh, it is visual, right? It's filled with um, graphic um, images. You know, so was Jesus teaching, right? Jesus taught in, in, uh, in stories and parables. You know what I mean? Jesus could have just said, you know, sometimes when you speak, some people get it and some people don't. He could have just said that, but that's not what he said. He said, a farmer goes out and sows the seed and some of that seed falls on hard ground and some of that, you know, remember? He told a parable, he told a story. He was saying the same thing, but it's an, an image that sticks um, with you. <clears throat> Jesus could have just said, you know, you can never um, so offend God with your sin and rebellion that you can't come home. The father wouldn't want you. Uh, he could have just said that. Instead, he said, you know, uh, uh, a father had two sons. And he tells a story, right, of a, of a prodigal son and an older brother. So God could have just said, I'm going to destroy evil. I am sending my son into the world, and I'm going to destroy um, evil, and I'm going to rescue a people for myself, and I'm going to heal the creation. But that's not what he did. He gave us the book of Revelation to say the same thing with pictures. You ready? Ready for one of those pictures? Chapter 16, if you have a Bible, hope you're turned there. Why don't you stand? We'll give our attention to it. So in chapter 16 is the outpouring of the wrath of God, bowls of wrath, seven bowls of God's wrath, starting at verse 1. Then I heard a loud voice from the temple telling the seven angels, go and pour out on the earth the seven bowls of the wrath of God. So the first angel went and poured out his bowl on the earth, and harmful and painful sores came upon the people who bore the mark of the beast and worshipped its image. The second angel poured out his bowl into the sea and it became like the blood of a corpse and every living thing died that was in the sea. The third angel poured out his bowl into the rivers and the springs of water and they became blood. And I heard the angel in charge of the waters say, just are you, O holy one, the one who is and who was, for you brought these judgments, for they have shed the blood of saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It's what they deserve. And I heard the altar saying, yes, Lord God, the almighty, true, and just are your judgments. Now the fourth angel poured out his bowl on the sun, and it was allowed to scorch people with fire. They were scorched by the fierce heat, and they cursed the name of God who had power over these plagues. They did not repent and give God glory. The fifth angel poured out his bowl on the throne of the beast and its kingdom was plunged into darkness. People gnawed their tongues in anguish and cursed the God of heaven for their pain and sores. And they did not repent of their deeds. The sixth angel poured out his bowl on the great river Euphrates and its water was dried up to prepare the way for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophets, three unclean spirits like frogs. I mean, it's getting a little out of hand right here, right? For they are demonic spirits performing signs who go abroad to the kings of the whole world to assemble them for battle on the great day of God the Almighty. Now, if you had a, a Bible, because it doesn't um, show, well, it's, it's it, in verse 15, because it indicates it in a different way, suddenly Jesus speaks. So if you have a Bible like mine, suddenly it's red lettered. Right in the middle of this um, vision that John has, he's receiving from God, Jesus himself speaks to John and says, Behold, I am coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who stays awake, keeping his garments on, that he may not go about naked and be seen exposed. Back to the vision. And they assembled them at the place that in Hebrew is called Armageddon. That was the sixth bowl. Now the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air and a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne saying, it is done. And there were flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder and a great earthquake such as there had never been since man was on the earth. So great was that earthquake. The great city was split into three parts. 
the cities of the nations fell, and God remembered Babylon the great to make her drain the cup of the wine of the fury of his wrath. Every island fled away. No mountains were to be found. Great hailstones, 100 pounds each, fell from heaven on people, and they cursed God for the plague of the hail because the plague was so severe. This then is the reading of God's holy, inspired and infallible word. Let's pray, Father, help us. These pictures are uh, strange to us, but inside this, um, this vision of the horror of falling into the hands of an angry God is incredible beauty. May we be drawn to it, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. All right, some of you spend your internet time, your free time, scrolling on your phone, reading Fox News and watching CNN. God bless you. Um, others of us uh, just look at funny videos. And uh, this is the one I got this week, and it just kills me. This little boy doing his um, uh, math lesson. If you didn't see it, I want to share it with you. Jaden has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How how much money? How much money does he have? Jaden broke. <laughs> Jaden had one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How much money Jaden had? Jaden broke. Let's play it again. Let's just play that again. Jaden has one dollar bill, one quarter, and two pennies. How how much money how much money does he have? Jaden broke. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. Let's go home. Yeah, I, I love that. It's like Okay, well, it didn't matter that I add that up. It didn't matter because that little boy says the end result is Jaden's broke, you know. One dollar, one quarter, and two pennies. Jaden is broke. It's the beauty of children. Sometimes they can see things so clear with clarity, right? Let's mix, you know, who needs the details here? Jaden is broke, right? Reminds me of you go to grandma's house when you're a little kid and, and, uh, and you've been given instructions on the whole ride over, maybe even days before, about not, don't complain, be appreciative for everything. And then grandma would bring out like this jello mold, some green jello with shredded carrots, like right inside the jello. Do you remember that? Were any of that inflicted on you? Like that was a treat. And, uh, and it would be, it'd be jiggling her masterpiece. She'd bring it out. And, uh, and somebody, uh, the youngest, would usually say, What? That's gross. That's disgusting. And everybody in the room already believed that, but only one person would say it, right? With, with uh, clarity, the king has no clothes, right? Um, you know, um, Revelation 16 is stating the obvious. You know what it's saying? The world's broke. This world is broke. And if you hitch your wagon to it, uh, if you pin your hopes, uh, align yourself with this world, then your future will be hell, figuratively and literally. The world is broke. That's what it's saying. And if your hope is found in this world, in this life, in this life alone, sometimes, you know, we forget that everybody's going to live eternally. Everybody's going to live on the other side of the grave. The, the, the checkout person at Publix, that's true. Your kid's soccer coach, that's true. Everybody's going to live on the other side of the grave. That person in the car, the person in the pew sitting with you right now, your next door neighbor, right? Everybody has an eternal destiny. And if you hitch your wagon to this world, it's broke. It's broke. And that will be a fateful choice. Your future will be hell Indeed, that's Revelation 16. It's a picture of the future, right? There are seven bowls poured out of wrath. Each is filled um, with this, this uh, wrath of God, right? Each bowl, it's, it's, it's a powerful. It's a story of deliverance for some and destruction of others. Now, you may have noticed it sounds a little bit like something else in the Bible. It sounds like the exodus from Egypt. 
So you've got plague after plague after plague, right? And, um, and, and how does the Exodus work? God's people are in bondage. God's people are delivered from bondage. And, uh, and they cross through the Jordan, uh, they cross through the Red Sea, and they are free. But the Egyptian, the country of Egypt, is left in utter ruins, right? Here we have God's people are going to be saved out of, this, um, uh, out of this horror of wrath. And yet those who are still here, it is going to be wretched Indeed. So I want you to just think real quick. We're just going to go through these uh, seven bowls, okay? So bowl number one, and they'll go up on the screen as I um, read them, um, perhaps. Bowl number one. Well, never mind. Um, Bowl number one is the earth. Bowl number two is the sea. Um, Bowl number three is the rivers. Bowl number four is the sky, right? So there you have it, the entire earth, the earth, the sea, the rivers, the sky. And bowl number one, if, you're, if, you're, uh, if you have the scriptures before you, the, your physical health is um, taken away. And bowl um, number two, you know, because bowl number one, um, uh, it says that they're, they're covered with sores, right? Um, and, uh, and, and so physical health is attacked. Bowl number um, two um, it says that the second angel pulled his bowl into the sea and every living thing died that was in um, the sea. And uh, the third bowl is um, the, the rivers are turned to blood. So just think about that. First of your physical health. Secondly, all the food supply of the world in the oceans and m- most of the world gets its food supplies. From those, it's all dead. Uh, much of the employment of all the people in the world is gone. And then all the rivers, all the clean drinking water is fouled. There's no water for people. There's no water for animals. You can just see the spreading destruction over all of the earth. Bowl bowl number four is the sky. The fourth angel scorches people. I mean, it sounds, frankly, it says they're scorched with fire. The sun pours down on the earth. It it sounds like global warming, but we'd better not go there. Um, Bowl number um, five is uh, darkness covers the earth and, uh, and torment. Some people have said verse 10 is the most dire verse, uh, the, the greatest torment in all the Bible. Um, the king, uh, people are plunged into darkness. They nod their tongues in anguish and curse the God of heaven for their pain and their sores. Bowl number six is the exact opposite of the red See, it says the Euphrates rivers is dried up. Remember, God dried up the Red Sea to allow his people to what? Escape. In this case, the Euphrates is dried up to allow the enemy armies to come in, right? It's like the moat is dried up and filled in and all their defenses are down. And we have this description of the great battle, Armageddon. And then bowl number seven is the collapse of everything. It is the collapse of all things. It is as if in reading this passage, God is going to allow the natural world, God is going to allow the earth to turn and pass judgment on mankind for our failure to care for the earth and our failure to care for each other. And the creation is going to strike back and destroy the inhabitants of the earth. And and in the process, it's all going to collapse in on itself. Got it? That's pretty much Revelation chapter 16. But I want you to love this passage um, because there's so much to love about this teaching. And and you might say, the wrath of God? Absolutely. So let's go for it, okay? Here we go. The wrath of God. Why should this be, uh, why should Revelation be uh, of great encouragement um, to us? Here's what I want to see first. You got an outline? You with me? You looking at your outline? There's There's extraordinary kindness in Revelation 16. An extraordinary kindness. Revelation 16 is a glimpse into the future showing the consequences that will befall those who will not repent. You know what repent means? It means you're going this direction with your life, but you say, I'm going the wrong way. And repent means turn around, okay? It's extraordinary kindness. I want you to see the kindness that we find in Revelation 16 is a a warning. God is letting us see the future, right? Right? He's telling us before it happens, this is what's going to happen if you continue to go the way in which you're going. Now, when this actually happens, right, in Revelation 16 to the people, it happens. They cannot uh, repent at this point. It's too late. They missed their opportunity. But he's telling us this before it happens. 
that nothing that keeps you from repenting now. But if you find yourself on this day, it's too late. You cannot repent. The moment of the repenting is over. Now is the day of repentance. You see the kindness of that? While there's time left, and we don't know how much time there is, but while there's time left, God is issuing a warning. God is actually letting us see the future, like time travel, right? Don't they have those shows? They have shows like, you know, somebody could go back now and stop Abraham Lincoln outside Ford's Theater and say, why don't you go home, right? You know, we can actually change history if we could go back because we know what's going to happen so we could go back and, and, uh, and alter it. That's exactly what we're being told here. Here's what's going to happen. Do something about it. Repent. And uh, what we're told of the people in that day is, uh, what does it say in both these verses? They did not repent. They did not give God glory. They did not repent of their deeds. They worshiped what God made. The description here is they worshiped food and wine and sunsets and sex and love and children and health. They worshiped what God made, but they didn't worship the God who made them. Tim Keller, um, requisite Tim Keller quote, if there's a God who created you and sustains your life every minute, not only do you owe it to him to love him supremely, but you will ruin yourself and everybody else if you don't. Leave that up there for just a minute. You will ruin yourself and everybody else if you don't give glory to the God who created you and sustains you for every minute. And here's the warning, the kindness of God um, telling us that. And, and it says in verse 15, I am coming like a thief. This is what Jesus says, verse 15. I'm coming like a thief. What do we know? A thief doesn't tell you, I'll be there Thursday at six, right? He shows up unexpected. I'm coming like a thief. Blessed is the one who is awake and aware. Take advantage of it while you have the opportunity. This is what God is saying. You don't know when the chance to heed this warning will be passed. Remember they used to have this thing called scared straight? Remember that? What was scared straight? They'd take high school juvenile delinquents and they'd bring them into a really hardcore prison. And then they'd let their, uh, the prisoners t uh, tell them what it was like. They'd, they'd, they'd essentially take these high school kids that were on a pathway to prison, but they'd take them inside the prison and say, let me show you your what? Your future in the hopes that what? It'll wake them up, right? Wake up, wake up, here's where you're going. Um, it almost, imagine if somebody considering crystal meth or some kind of drug that you know within a, 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 not a very long period of time will, will strip their dignity, will essentially strip their health. It will strip their life, it will destroy them. What if before they ever took it the first time, they could suddenly, somebody could take their iPad and say, I've got a picture of you Four years from now, homeless, on the streets, desperate, prostituting yourself. If you take this drug, I've got a picture of it. That's what Revelation 16 is. Here's the future. You want this future? It's a beauty. It's a beautiful warning. The kindness of God. Overcome with the kindness of God. So I was going to show you this commercial, um, uh, but, but uh, the staff... Um, vetoed it um, because it's a little graphic um, but it's a, it's, a, it's a TV commercial it's on TV it shows a couple a cute young couple they get in a car they're like um, um, they're, they're like newly married and they're going to look for a house you know together and they're all excited and well they jump in the car and, and, and as they're driving through their neighborhood a car comes barreling through a stop sign in a side street smashes into their car and the, and the, the man who's driving barrels through the window of the car, goes tumbling through the air. It's all in slow motion, the commercial. And he's about to smash into the pavement. And then the commercial stops, right? As he's just hovering an inch above the pavement. And then it throws the whole commercial in reverse. He goes all the way back. The window of the car comes together, goes all the way in reverse. Their car backs, the accident doesn't happen. It backs all the way back to when they first got in the car. And what does he do? He puts his seatbelt on. Right? So what's the commercial saying? What if you could know? What if you could know where this goes? Buckle up, right? Buckle up, it'll save your life. Here we have this warning before us from God. 
and not only a warning, but, but an, it's an appeal, the kindness of this sweet appeal from God, come to me. You know, as each bowl is poured out, God is saying, every single thing you trust for your security, or every single thing you pin your hopes on in this world, it's sinking sand. Come to me. Come to me. I wonder how it feels like to live in southwest Louisiana this morning. Their second hurricane in, in a month. I mean, if, if your hopes were pinned in your possessions, if your hopes there were um, uh, in your house, your abode, your land, your property, my oh my, uh, everything we cling to in this world will fail us. I'm telling you folks, God is speaking to you tonight in the reading of Revelation 16. He's telling us this is the future. Do not put your hopes on anything but Jesus. As best I'm able tonight, I am fighting for your eternal destiny. I've showed you the future. And I'm saying there's a better way. Come to Jesus. Now, you know, some people would say, yeah, I, you know, the wrath of God, uh, hell, all of that, that's where... That's why I don't like God. That's why I don't like going to church, you know. I just don't think there's, that nice people are going to go to um, hell. I can't see that. That's, some, that's not my God. Um, well, let me tell you a little story about Aunt Edna. Aunt Edna is a fictional character. She's a nice lady. Um, she makes, you know, cookies for the grandkids. She has a rescue dog, right? Um, she pays her taxes. She she grows cute little flowers in front of her little um, humble house. Uh, she's a decent, good person, um, but she's never much gone in for the church thing, right? Um, not the Bible thing, not the God thing, really. Um, so how would Aunt Edna ever go to hell? We're not talking about Bin Laden here, right? We're talking about Aunt Edna. Um, so let's think through Aunt Edna's life for just a minute. Um, you know, when she was young, um, she would hear the story of the Bible, the story of Jesus, like at Easter and, and, uh, and Christmas time. And, you know, God would whisper to her. And you know what he'd say? You can learn more about me if you want to. I'd love for you to. God would whisper to Edna, I'd love for you to be my child. But she made a little decision. I'm not going to do that. I'm going to pursue other things. So there'd be other times in her life as she was growing up, you know, that she'd experience the awe of a, of a sunset, right? Or maybe it was the wind whistling through the trees. Maybe it was a snow-capped mountain. Maybe it was a babbling um, brook. And God would whisper to her through his creation and say, you know, I made this. And he'd say to her, I made you. You didn't get here on your own. You know that. You can know me, and you could say thanks for everything I've made. But she made a little decision. No, I will not acknowledge you. I won't give thanks. So as Edna lived out her life, you know, there were times that she um, um, did things that were wrong, bad. Nobody's perfect, right? Uh, and God would whisper to her through her conscience, you know you can be forgiven, you know you need it. I'll give you a fresh start. I'll do that for you. Just confess and repent. Come to me. And she made a little decision. No. I will not bend the knee. And I will not repent. You know, as she grew older, she went to a lot of her comrades and friends and associates got old and she ended up going to a lot of funerals and at every funeral, she was confronted with her own, you know, mortality. Someday it would be her who would die. And at every funeral, God would whisper to her, you can't beat death, Edna. The fear of death and the longing for something more is there in every human being. And if you ask me, you know, if you say yes to me, you can be with me forever. She made a little decision. No. No. I will not ask. No. So at the end of her life, 
She said no to God a thousand times. She locked the door of her heart over and over again. She will not confess, submit, worship, or serve him. She wants only one thing, and that is for God to leave her alone. And when God leaves you alone, there's a word for that. The Bible calls that what? Hell. God doesn't have to send anyone to hell. People go there on their own. People get what they, God simply gives people what they've asked for their whole life. For God to leave them alone. Let them be. So tonight I stand before you and say, you've seen the future. Come on. Say yes. Say yes. God invites you to come to him. You know what I love? When people say yes to God, you know what they find him to be? So kind. Gentle. Gracious. When you say yes to God, somebody in this room needs to say yes to God tonight. When you say yes to God, you never regret it. Never. Got it? Revelation 16 is a warning and an invitation. It's beautiful. Secondly, I want you to see in this passage, not only that, it's filled with hope. Not only filled with the sweetness of, of warning and invitation, but it's filled with hope of all things wrong being righted. All the wrongs of this world righted. Some people say, I'm, I'm really not you know, fond of the wrath of God. If I had to choose between a God of wrath and a God of love, I'm going for the God of love. I want a God of love. Do you understand that wrath is a corollary of love? If you don't have wrath, you don't have love. You understand that? You can't have a God of love who doesn't have wrath. There's no such thing. It doesn't work that way. You're walking out of a uh, restaurant with your wife. You've got to go and, uh, and get the car and pull it up. You come back and you find that a couple men have knocked her down and they're beating her. Um, and you, you, know, you help her up and get her in the car and drive away, right? Is that how it works? But it, it, and, you, and you say to the men, um, I don't appreciate you're doing this. No, you respond with what? Wrath towards the people who are assaulting the one that you love. If you don't have wrath towards that which would damage or destroy, that which is lovely, beautiful, good, and that which you love, then you don't love, right? Well, God loves. The wrath of God reveals the love of God. Love wants to destroy uh, that which threatens what it loves. Wrath is God's strong and settled opposition to evil. It's his burning zeal for all that is right and just. Genesis 16 ought to give, think of all the people who have lived in the history of the earth who have been squashed by people who are more powerful than them. That all the rights are going to be, all the wrongs are going to be righted by God. God is settling everything right. He's setting everything right. I mean, I wonder, have your, has your heart ever been roiled by injustice? Injustice. In, uh, in 1893, Bob Hudson, wife, was assaulted. Bob Hudson and his wife were black. They lived in Weekly County uh, near Memphis, Tennessee. His wife was assaulted by a man and she turned that uh, man into the sheriff and he was fined for what he did, that white man. However, a mob of 10 masked white men came to their house, dragged her out into the yard and beat her. And when he intervened on behalf of his wife, they shot him and they lynched him. Just one example of thousands upon thousands who have been squashed by brutality. I mean, don't you, don't you look at this world and say, God, come on, it's time, intervene. Bring your wrath to bear on evil wherever it is. Just a couple years ago, here's your brothers and sisters on the beach. Um, 
31 Coptic Christian, Egyptian Christians were beheaded on that beach uh, by ISIS. There's a picture of it. Um, it says right in this passage uh, in, in, uh, in Revelation 16, for they have shed the blood of the saints and prophets and you have given them blood to drink. It is what they deserve. Um, sex trafficking of children, abuse of women, the aborting of the unborn, inhospita inhospitality to the immigrant, not welcoming the immigrant. These things make the heart of God, the just heart of God, angry. And Revelation 16 says the day is coming when all wrong will be set right. How else could you live in this world? How else could you live in this world without knowing that the God who made it is going to set everything right? And with that certain day ahead of us, how does that affect us now? God's people walk into the darkness and brokenness of our world and we sing the song of triumph. Do you know that? We're not beaten by our world. We're not beaten by the darkness. We walk right into the heart of the darkness and we are not afraid. Or if we are afraid, we walk there anyway. And we sing this song sometimes together. Mine eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. Right? He is trampling out the vintage where the grapes of wrath are stored. Where do you think those words are taken from? Right out of the book of Revelation. He has loosed the fateful lightning of his terrible swift sword. His truth is marching on. So we walk into the darkness and brokenness of this world because our God is just. So his people work for justice, right? His people protect the innocent and the broken and the weak and the battered of this world. That's who we are. We are unafraid because we know that God will triumph over all that is evil. So I could pull out so many illustrations of the way that I see uh, people in this church doing this uh, so courageously and, and innovatively and passionately. Do you know that there is a, a person in our church, I didn't even know this, I've known this person for years, I didn't know this till a couple months ago, but they employ either ex-prisoners or, or people who have had addiction issues that can't get jobs. This person employs them. And the way he employs them is he buys um, houses. And, uh, and then they have to be renovated. And so he um, shows them how to do it. He trains them how to do it if they don't know how. And they, uh, they, they renovate these houses. They flip the houses, right? They improve them. And then, when he, and, then, uh, and then he sells them very often to one of those people or to uh, somebody else who could never afford a house. Uh, and, well, how would they ever get a loan to buy the house? Well, they don't have to get a loan. He holds the mortgage. And he doesn't charge any um, interest in particular. He doesn't make anything off the whole project. He sells them the house at no profit to himself. Giving them jobs, giving them housing, giving them dignity. Improving neighborhoods, improving houses, improving the look of broken down places. All of this, why? Because Jesus is making all things new. And so God's people are busy making all things new. Right where we are, right in our world, every single day, that's what we do. Last Saturday, I left during church and went to hospice because a man, a member, a member of our church, Ernie Thomas, had a heart attack last Saturday and he died last Sunday night. You know what Ernie Thomas did for years? Guardian ad litem. Ernie Thomas, a retiree in our church, um, uh, represented children that needed representation in our system he was on the battle lines for people, for children who needed an advocate, right? This is how Jesus is honored. This is how his people take his, uh, the beauty. That's, that's the beauty of Revelation chapter 16. All wrongs will be righted. God gives us this vision to remind us that though this world with devils filled should threaten to undo us, we will not fear for God hath willed his truth to what? triumph through us. All wrongs will be righted. Got it? Pretty good passage, isn't it? The wrath of God. What does it reveal to us? That God loves us so much that he's warning us, right? He's coming like a thief in the night. We don't know when he's coming. So repent. Come to him. He'll have you. And not only that, he's going to heal the world and make all things new. And while we wait for him to do that, we get to join him in it even now. 
And third and finally then, this passage describes an unbelievable sacrificial love that has the power to change not only any life, it has the power to even change our lives. Why did Jesus show this picture of the coming wrath to John? What do we know about the apostle John? He is the disciple that, he described himself as the disciple that Jesus what? He could quite possibly was Jesus' favorite person on the planet. Jesus loved John. And so Jesus shows this picture to John so that John would know, this is how much I love you. This is what's headed your way, but I took it for you, John. I want you to see what I took for you. I want you to see what would have been your fate if I had not come. So who deserves wrath? Who deserves the wrath of God? Charles Manson? Ted Bundy? Who deserves the wrath of God? You do. This should have been your story. Who gets the wrath of God? It says in verse 19, well, we have the It describes there the great city was split into three parts. All the cities of the nations fell. Babylon the Great was made to drink the cup of the wine of the fury of God's wrath. Who gets wrath? Everybody will drink the cup of God's wrath. Everyone. Unless you have a substitute who will drink it for you. Everyone will drink the cup of God's wrath down to the last drop. Unless you have a substitute who will drink it in your stead. This is Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane, isn't it? Father, let this cup, he said, pass from me. What cup do you think he's talking about? The cup of the wrath of God. Father, let this cup pass from me. The horror the horror that made Jesus recoil. Is there another way? Wrath of God. Right in the middle of this passage, right at the climax of this passage, the seventh bowl, the seventh bowl is like the grand finale. It's like a firework show, right? When every kind of evil just falls out of the sky on the earth. I want you to know that in the Gospel of John, only, only in the Gospel of John, it's only John, the John who got the vision of Revelation, who records these words, that when Jesus died on the cross, his last words were what? It is finished. It's done. The cup is consumed. So what does it say in chapter 16, verse 17 and 18? When the seventh angel poured out his bowl into the air, a loud voice came out of the temple from the throne. Who's on the throne in the temple? You've been following in the book of Revelation? Who's sitting on the throne? The lamb. The lamb that was slain is on the throne. And out of the temple comes a voice from the throne saying, it is finished. And there were flashes of lightning. Remember what happened when Jesus died? Here, John is recalling beautifully, isn't he? What he experienced standing by the mother of Jesus when Jesus died, right? It is done. Right in the middle of this cataclysmic judgment uh, is this declaration. Here is the way out of the judgment you deserved. I paid for it. It's finished. Everything that separates you from, from the Father I have taken responsibility for. It's done. It's paid for. Your debt is paid. So I'm telling you, Revelation 16 is beautiful, right? Not only do we have this warning from God, what kindness. Invitation from God, come to me. God's promise that he's going to right all wrongs in this world. And then this beautiful picture of the most sacrificial love God rescued us from what we deserve. 
I could say it was true of me and I bet you could say the same, that we are, we are naturally attracted to everything more than we are attracted to God. We love every idol of this world more than we love the God who made us and loves us like this. And left to ourselves, we would run after all of them to our eternal destruction. Oh, to grace, how great a debtor. Daily, I'm constrained to be. We deserve judgment as much as anybody who receives it. Do you believe that? Do you believe that the wrath of God is what you deserve? But we've received sacrificial love. So, I read a story not long ago about a a paramedic. His name was Matt Swatzel. And uh, Matt was... um, worked a 24-hour shift. You know, he's giving his life to save lives. He worked a 24-hour shift. He only slept the half hour. And on his way home to sleep, a terrible thing happened. He heard a terrible, terrible sound. You see, he fell asleep. And his car drifted, his truck drifted over the line. And it smashed into another vehicle. And in that vehicle was June Fitzgerald, a 30-year-old wife, her 19-month-old daughter, and she was pregnant to boot. And so the paramedic who gives himself to save lives got out of his truck and went over and found that because he'd fallen asleep, he had taken two lives, the life of a mother and an unborn And you can imagine he plummeted into the worst of despair until something happened. You know, he wasn't allowed to contact the other family because of the legal ramifications and all that. But uh, at the court, um, the man who's lost his wife and his unborn child came and appealed to the judge on his behalf. And he expressed his forgiveness. He said that Jesus had forgiven him much more than he would be required to forgive this man. And he said, this man gives his life for people in this community and we need him back on his job. And he begged for no prison or anything for this man. And um, not long after that, um, Matt Swartzel, the paramedic, pulled into Publix, and um, guess who was walking in at the same time? And uh, trembling, he walked up to introduce himself. And uh, the man, um, Eric Fitzgerald, um, said, you know what, Matt? I would really love for you to be in my life. And now they're really good friends. They eat uh, breakfast together two times every month. Um, Here's a picture of uh, of Matt. That's the little girl who was 19 months old. So that's a girl standing with her uncle Matt now, the man whose negligence killed her mother. What would Matt Swartzel say? This sacrificial kindness and love saved his life. It changed everything. I want to tell you something. It has that power in your life too. It always does. The sacrificial love of Jesus. We're broke. The world's broke and we're broke. But there's medicine. There's only one thing that can make us well. Run to Jesus. Amen.